All right. Welcome. Welcome to the Biblos Network. We are so glad that you came. We're glad that you have decided to join us and talk about the great things of God. We've had a great week here at our Nexus Conference. We've had amazing preaching. Um, enjoyed the ministry of Pastor Nathan Cox and Pastor Tim Adams. Pastor Nathan Holmes is, is next up at Nexus. See what I did there? Um, just some of the good stuff you'll get here at Biblos. It's deep stuff like that. But we're glad you're here. We trust that you are enjoying the blessings of God where you are. Um, it is our day. It is an apostolic time of blessing and vision. And hopefully we can help a little bit with that here as we talk about the things of God. I've got some good friends here with me today. And um, I can't wait to talk with them and share the conversation with you. I've got the great Kurt Kanai and Dave Howell, both from Little Rock, Arkansas. God bless you guys. We're so glad you're here. Oh, thanks for having us. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, you guys have, uh, people don't know this, but we have worked together for a very <laughs> long time. Yeah, very, very long time. We've known each other. On all sorts of different things. Yeah, yeah all kinds of collaboration, collaborative dynamics. Some successful, some not so much so. <laughs> That's right. We won't talk about no. that. We'll, we'll leave those under the blood yeah. and move, look to the future. Yeah. <laughs> but God has helped us, and you guys do such an amazing job. We love it when you can come here to Durham and help us. You've helped our music. You have helped the choir immensely. Um, I know Joseph and Cheyenne, they love working with you. So I'm glad you're here in Durham and can help us with Nexus. Thanks for having us. It's a pleasure to be back. Yeah. And Kurt's got the convo. Yeah, sweatshirt. Let's give a little shout out to to Condo. Little, little little thing that we do on the side. Not as not anything as good as this. Oh yeah. well, I, if I know anything about you guys, it will it'll be a rocket ship. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, this so this is your podcast. The Combo is your podcast. Yeah, we just talk about music, life, reality, yeah. things like that. Me and Colton Duty, all the good stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, this. Have you guys been here for every Nexus? I, I think so. It's the third one, right? Yeah. Yeah. This I is our so. third Nexus. Yep. I love that. But we've gone back. We go way back. We go back to the Ignite days in yeah. Birmingham, Alabama. What years were That was a good time. A very good time. Yeah. We started in 2009. Wow. 2010. You know, that's over a decade ago. Wow. <laughs> all, all I can think about right now is that I just want to thank you for letting me be myself here. Yeah. Yes. I remember that. Yeah. We pushed the envelope a lot. So there is a little backstory to that. We, we've <laughs> always believed in looking to the future and just exploring a lot of different venues for ministry. And one night, first of all, Ignite Services were they were amazing. They would get very up tempo. Amazing musicians. You guys always did a world class job. But there was that one night <laughs> where a little, like, I don't know, a little sly in the family stone got slipped yeah. in. <laughs> but I actually have something to add to that. So at, <clears throat> this shows the complete and utter lack of understanding for me when it comes to secular music much at all, especially back in that time frame. I had no idea that that was a throwback to a song that. Yeah, many people there knew and immediately started laughing and yeah. really enjoying on a completely different level. So for those who intended. don't realize that that Donnie McClurkin took that <laughs> yes. and incorporated it into, and a lot of people didn't even realize <laughs> yeah. that that was a throwback. I thought it was a great vamp. Yeah, <laughs> I had no idea. It was pretty catchy. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, man, this could go big. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know why everybody was laughing. I'm like, I thought it was a great song. I didn't know it's funny. Yeah, well, I remember laying hands on somebody. Jesus, Jesus, and then I heard. <laughs> Thank you for letting me be myself, and I stopped. <laughs> yeah. But it was, it was awesome. Good times. It was good times. <laughs> well, I, uh, one of the things I, I love about you guys, and I actually want to talk about it today, is you guys, you guys fight for excellence. Um, Pentecost, maybe deserved, maybe undeserved. A lot of times, Apostolic Pentecost gets a, a, a rap for being backwater, for being um, a little off the beaten path. 
maybe a little second tier or third tier or fourth tier, <laughs> depending on which part of the country you're in. But you know, there's people that are very sincere people. They jump up, they give it the best they have and, and they do well. But you know, I believe that if we're going to be children of the most high God, we should give our best effort, whatever that is. So if it's all you have to work with where you are, give it your best. But if you have a lot to give, whom much is given, much is required. And you guys fight for that. So tell me about your thoughts on excellence in Pentecost. What drives you to do what you do and to contend for excellence? You want to take that first? No, you can go ahead. How about I'll give a start to it, okay, and then ahead. you can springboard off of it. <clears throat> I think it's um, a term that's often misunderstood. Brother Shin, in my opinion, musically speaking, in Apostolic Pentecost. I think many people interpret excellence as professionalism or perfection, that we're, we're striving for either one of those two things. When to me, I, I think over the years, I've just come to think of excellence in music the same way we would with anything else. Our child in school, for example, we expect them to do the best that they can do if that happens to be at a B student level, then so be it. That's the best they can put forward. <clears throat> and I think it scales very much to music where, um, you know, we we tend to be, oh, we tend to give it whatever we need to give to get through the service. We come to sort of the lowest point that we need to to get through a service oftentimes, as opposed to saying, you know what, let me tackle this and give it my very best at everything I've got. Th that to me would be the difference between excellence and maybe the other thoughts around this less than excellence perfection yeah or or um yeah professionalism so to speak yeah your yeah. thoughts um i think i think with excellence especially uh in the church i think it's a lot about a culture a mindset that you set up for like mm -hmm. hey we're just gonna you know do our best we're gonna you know we're gonna try to be prepared so that when a situation presents itself, you can tackle it. You know, it comes across as the best that you can do. I'll tell a short story. It was a gentleman uh, from Kansas that one day called me and was like, hey, I'm gonna come to you guys midweek and I'm just gonna shadow you. I'm gonna come to sound check and everything. So he came, sat behind me the whole time. Uh, you know, in our sound check, we went over the three songs that we were planning to do in service that night. You know, service went the way that it does. We did one song and it blew up and we just shouted for like an hour. And he comes to me after church and he was like, hey, can I tell you something? Like without you being offended, I'm like, sure. He's like, I've watched you guys broadcast and like I've seen you guys shout for like an hour or whatever. And he was like, I thought you guys like practice that, like practice the shout music. And I'm like, I was like caught off guard. I'm like, what do you mean? He was like, like, how do you, I until I saw it, I saw that you prepared for these three songs. <clears throat> And then it blew up and you went play shout music. You guys didn't even practice the shout music, but the shout music sounded as good as the songs you prepared. Yeah. And and I was like, wow, I wonder how many other people think this. First of all, that was my first thought. But I mean, we had practiced shout music before, like on a Saturday or on mm -hmm. a Thursday night, because we wanted when the opportunity yeah. arrived that it doesn't sound like, you know, we're four guys that just got off the bus and yeah. oh, we're gonna play in church tonight. Like, yeah. you know, we wanna give God our best. It's It's our form of worship. It's one of our forms that's so of worship. there, right there. Our form of worship. So that's a powerful statement. You're you're taking responsibility for it. You are looking at it as your. This is your lamb. This is your bullock. This is your sacrifice of praise. Mm -hmm. um, well, last night I, I noticed it. Last night um, we the choir sang um, the John. Turn he's, around. Yeah, every time I turn around, he's making a way. It's a favorite of mine. I can remember being much younger and just loving that song and when you guys went into it i was waiting on all the little cues and i was right with it and um i don't know if uh, the young man singing it was as familiar maybe with that particular song i think he mentioned that he had a bunch of john key albums but maybe not that one but there's a, a comeback in that and when i walked up I, it was just all over me yeah. i could feel it like hanging on a ledge and I was tempted, but I had not practiced. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm feeling the tempo, the people are worshiping. All I did was look at Kurt, and Kurt, it, it was a millisecond. He went, 
and just put his hands on the keys. <laughs> and he was ready. So that kind of preparedness. So they say luck favors the prepared. Right. But in our case, God blesses. He blesses you when you put forth your best, your best effort. Absolutely. Um, and you certainly don't need to hear us say this, but <clears throat> there's certainly scriptural precedent for it. When you think about in Psalms, David referencing <clears throat> playing skillfully. Skillfully. Hard to play skillfully if you haven't applied yourself and learned how to do that. Um, in the dedication of the temple, when the scripture reference talks about they all played as with one voice, talking about something like 300 trumpet players. Yeah. That didn't happen by accident. And then just thinking about the broader principle of whatsoever your hands find it to do, do mm-hmm. it with all your might. Those things to me all apply to what we do. And we've seen the opposite side of it. We all have at points, whether it's an altar song gone wrong because we could only do something that we could read a chart for maybe, or we just thought this one needed to go there and we weren't prepared to flow and we weren't thinking yeah. ahead. Yeah. Um, or any other part of the service where it just, it didn't go quite the way that it could. It got mm-hmm. in the way because people weren't as prepared as they could be. Yeah. I think that's that seems to be the goal a lot. And what, what we're talking about too is how do we prepare such that we're not a problem for what happens? We can over prepare and then maybe not need it. Yeah. We don't want the opposite to happen. Yeah, totally. That's a good point. You can over prepare. It's better to over prepare than to be caught flat footed. Yeah. So years ago, we started a home missions church in Fort Myers. I did not have a piano player. And so I was forced into a position where it was sing every song a cappella or learn to chord. And I really appreciated people who put the hours in to hone their craft. So the way that looks growing up, so you're a kid, you're a little kid, somebody sits you down in front of a piano, and was it just the grind for a period of time? Uh, Dave, well, I know for me, I hated piano at first, because I was learning, like, I grew up in Toronto, I was studying in the Royal Conservatory, um, classical music, my parents made all of us do it, and uh, I hated it. So your parents were like, you're playing the piano. Oh, yeah. Me and my sister and brother, we all went to piano lessons every week for years. Like, you know, learning all these classical. And I, I just, I didn't, I hated it. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then somewhere along the way, I got a love for it. Did my it mom, click? Yeah, well, I still, I, I guess I never, it was like once gospel music happened. You know, that's where the, my mom, even to this day, is like, aren't you glad I forced you to go to piano lessons? <laughs> like all the time she says that. I'm like, yes, mom, I'm very glad. Yes. Yeah. Oh, but you're, you've got another angle to your story that, to, uh, as well that most people don't realize, I don't think. I mean, you were predominantly a, a drummer for yeah, many years. Right. You're a drummer? Yeah. Well, I played drums in church for like years and years and years. Wow. And, uh, you know, I always say, whenever I tell this story, I'm like, hey, if you're apostolic, you understand. One Sunday I got to church and the family of the keyboard player decided they were going to start their own church. Yeah. Just on a Sunday morning. It happens all the time. Yeah. So, you know, they were like. Well, you take piano lessons. You're the keyboard player now at the church. <laughs> what? Like, like yeah. today, starting today, I had never played in church before. It was oh like, my! Yeah. So of course, you know, once you're 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 terrible. I'm a terrible musician, you know. Yeah. And of course, everyone who has a mic can tell me how to do it better. Yes. But obviously, not. They couldn't do it better, or they would be doing it. So yeah. that was my journey of. That is so yeah. funny, man. <laughs> just throwing you in the deep end of the pool. Yeah. There's a lot of apostolic kids that learn just yeah. like that. That's why. That's why the, the thing about it is that's why when you look on all these, like, if you look at a professional gig with secular people that, you know, people making big money, they're almost all like church kids. It's, I've noticed that. Yeah. There are, there's a stunning, very few secular people are going to just have sat down and just learned the piano and became successful. Yeah. Yeah. But one day somebody was telling me the amount of PAW musicians yep. that they're, they're the, the children of bishops or grandchildren of bishops and like Babyface and John Legend and people like that. Yep. People you wouldn't dream because they're secular artists that got their start in churches. Yeah, there's tons of church musicians that they just, they just have all the <laughs> good jobs, if you were. Yeah. 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 Babyface, Kenneth Edmonds, he was raised at Grace Apostolic. Indianapolis. In, in Indianapolis, yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. He yeah. played a role later on in really helping them at a time when they were really struggling. I heard a little bit about this. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't realize all the details. Though. I heard that he rescued them from some pretty difficult hardships. Hmm. Yeah. Just, you just never know. But the point 
to be made is if God is gifting you and you are heading into something, give everything you have. Do it if it's worth doing. Do it right, mm-hmm. yep. and and fight for it. Well, what that turns into then is a culture of excellence for for the glory of God, not just for the sake of being a perfectionist, but to glorify the Lord. Yeah, yeah. We're not, when we're at the church, sometimes I talk to the choir. I mean, you you have to think we have maybe a hundred people in the choir on a mass Sunday night, not that many, which maybe a hundred, let's say a hundred. Well, if you're at a church of 2,500, a hundred people is not a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we usually say, hey, not everybody at this church can sing. You can sing even if it's just a little bit. God decided that he wanted you to be a singer. Like you owe him to give that back to him. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like you, and then so what do you gotta do? You gotta cultivate that. Every music department has one of three people. There's a person that shows up and has and has done more than they've been asked to do. The person that does exactly what they've been asked to do and the person that doesn't even, you know, you got three songs to learn, you only learn two. Yeah. You know, they don't do exactly what they've been asked to do. If every music department can find a way to get everyone to go to the next step, that music department will experience exponential growth. Yeah. And it's not... It's not a lot. It's not a lot if you just think about it. You're just, if you're not doing what you're asked to do, just all we're doing you to do is ask, do what you, or, you know, just do what we're asking you to do. Yeah. And it, it's huge. It will be like exponential growth. Well, this is from a musical perspective, um, piano and learning, but you tapped into directing. You're a very good director. Yes. You're kind. Excellent. I like the hand motions and he, yeah. th- somehow like energy comes out of him. You can feel like, electricity going into alto tenor and soprano <laughs> all i know is i'm exhausted and too old for it <laughs> you've been doing it a long time man <laughs> but you you're you're a high tenor aren't you um, you know probably not compared to some but most i think compared to most yeah i, I tend to be a little on the higher side of the range um particularly a few years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the time passes, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, but I actually started on piano as well. Organ, truthfully. I, I took organ lessons first more than anything, um, or before anything, rather, and I was about seven, and like Kurt, absolutely hated it. I took from a, a lady in, in the town that I grew up in, just professional lessons, learning how to sight read. She couldn't really play by ear at all, and that's all that any kid in church wants to do, <laughs> yeah. is play like the people in church. So all of that sort of came in tandem with taking lessons, but not so much from the lessons. Mm-hmm. In hindsight, I'm, I'm really glad to have had the professional um, training, so to speak. You know, wasn't a conservatory in Canada, but it was enough to be able to understand how to sight read and understand basic music theory. And that's actually played out very well. So to any, you know, any kid these days taking lessons wondering when their opportunity is going to come if they're back in those early stages and learning all of that it all comes together and now i'm sure kurt sees the same thing in most pentecostal churches you you really don't find many people that can understand how to basic sight read yeah or really understand basic music theory and it really does take you a lot further you understand songs on a different level you understand harmony differently Mm -hmm. than if you don't have that and what we do see is probably more commonly where kids come up they aspire to play in church and they take lessons long enough to start playing in church there's a need at the church like what kurt described his situation as being and and maybe a kid gets thrown into it at 12 13 years old and to them that's like the epitome of what they've wanted and they stop taking lessons Mm -hmm. so in the spirit of excellence you you just kind of shot yourself in the foot on that one yeah is what you could be if you just kept playing church but keep going and absorb and learn and grow. Um, there aren't a lot of people that do that. Yeah. Once they once they're in church, to, 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 they they feel like they've sort of hit the apex of of uh, what they wanted to accomplish, and they don't keep pushing themselves. It's rare to find somebody that does. Well, what you guys are now doing is something that has kind of gone dormant in Oneness Pentecost. There was a time in Oneness Pentecost. Um, it's probably the Laney Wolf years, mm-hmm. where there was a. An excellence in music songwriting beautiful songs um the musicianship the the rigor in teaching parts and the harmony but then somewhere we just started borrowing from the denominal world we just 
let them do all the work and the, the songs are nowhere near the the beautiful apostolic songs that were written and there's this push now in this generation yeah, sure. and you have a passion we've talked about it before of creating writers and creating creatives that are going to bring that back so what where'd that come from well i mean touching back on the landing wolf thing that you're talking about i mean some even right now if you go to a communion at even some denominal churches they're going to sing some songs that landing wolf wrote mm -hmm. like and he was you know like cutting edge at the time and i just think that we need it's like a culture thing like i said if your members came here on sunday and you preach like a obvious td jake's message on mm -hmm. the sunday they'd be like brother urchin like you know what are you doing <laughs> but we sing songs that we've got from other people all the time it's not normal I mean, we think it's normal. Yeah. Well, maybe we should think it's not normal. You know, one, until we get our mindset until like, hey, every church has a song of the house. Mm -hmm. We just got to dig it out. Boy, and I, like I think that. it's a matter of like, once you, I think once you decide that, like now when we have conferences, we're singing, you know, songs that we may have arranged or written or other Pentecostal people have written and they work. Like if a song works at my church, it's going to work at your church, even though our services may differ yeah. at the end of the day, like the root of our, the move of God that we're looking for is the same. Mm -hmm. Like, so I think it's a matter of like every church, there's probably somebody in your church that can song write. You just got to find out. And we got to develop, we got to, we got to go back to, I think doing that. It's a really a passion of mine. Um, I have something going on next month. That's going to be like the first step to that. And mm -hmm. hopefully, you know, we'll look back on this podcast in five years and it will be, an, you know, everybody's writing their own songs. I think that would be great if we could do that. That would be amazing. Well, so Jackson College of Ministry in Jackson, Mississippi, um, years ago, it turned out a ton of creative talent. Um, and so, you know, it had challenges, and, but it also had many, many good points. Mm -hmm. And one of the good points was excellence in music. Yeah. It, it, it affected all of Pentecost. Um, I forget all the names, but, you know, we are standing on holy ground. Um, just surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Yeah. Um, just songs that move people and have been used profoundly over over time um is it just is it just a lack of of effort or maybe even a, an awareness that we're not even producing this anymore this isn't a thing i have a couple thoughts on this one so do i yeah I th I where, 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 did, where did it go <laughs> sideways what and and how do we excuse me i, I think and kurt's certainly going to have far more perspective on the writing side of it to go back to your point, it links very much to this around the music that we use in services today, how we'll borrow from, name any secular or, or uh, so-called mainstream Christian artists, we'll, yeah. we'll sing their songs. Um, I think some of it links back to this idea of excellence that we've talked about. And, and let me be clear, I'm certainly not knocking anybody that needs to use a chord chart or is seeking to have some help as they're trying to learn and grow. I think if we were probably encouraging anybody to do anything, it would be to push beyond that at some point, use the helps that you're given. But on this point, a lot of churches started doing just the songs they could find chord charts for, yeah. mm -hmm. or songs that guitar players could play that were very simple. You notice a lot of those songs are in sharps. They're easy mm -hmm. guitar keys. They're two or three chords. I so they're, can't stop. Stand that. They're easy songs, though, to pull into a service for um, uh, maybe you know a music team that's that's young or not as advanced in their knowledge. Yeah, and yeah. I think that's had you know that's been a factor to some degree on pulling music like that in. It's easy, which then you go back to okay, when do we push beyond what's easy? When do we actually hit that stride where we're the best we can be? So it's, it's very much linked to it, in my opinion. I think that's influenced our culture. Second part I would add to that is I, I just think like the idea of writing and creating is something very foreign to probably many musicians. They're, they're looking for the next song to grab and do, yeah. but not necessarily to create. And I think that that's where Kurt has a huge influence on the apostolic movement. So I have a different, I could, be, I could be so wrong, and feel free to tell me if I'm wrong, but I feel like during the height of the apostolic movement, music movement, we focused on a lot on the talent and not so much on the character of the people that were doing that. Talk about that right so, there. So what happened was, I mean, you know, they, they always say your talent gets you in the door, but your character will keep you in the room. Mm -hmm. You know, people's character wasn't where it should be. And then so what started happening is we started attacking. Instead of 
we started attacking just musicians. You know what I'm saying? All these musicians are, they're this problem because they don't have, you know, and it's not all of them. It was just a few. Yeah. But then now we labeled it as music is bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so let's get, you know, and then they, you know, whatever happened, it, the focus was gone. You're getting preached at from the pulpit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I used to give you a hard time that yeah. I was like, brother Urshan, you, you yeah. got to like lay off. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to straighten the musicians yeah. out, man. <laughs> well, I think it was something. But look, to, I did a great job. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> So that's actually part of what, you know, on my journey right now, like I go to a church where prayer is talked about heavily and it's not just talked about, it's like in practice, like we're, our musicians, we all, you know, we all keep each other um, where we're going to the church and signing in and praying because it's a big part of it. It's our character. We're working on our character as much as we're being disciplined Yes. in our character as much as we are in our music. And if we can just make that like a a norm if we can normalize wow. it wow then it, the we'll, we as we build our talent back our character is going to ride with it and then we're, you know if our character is up here and our talents up here we're going to be have a better chance at success at long term success so let me give you some theology there okay when the priest would go into the holy of holies he had a certain hymn on the bottom of his garment and it was one bell and one pomegranate one bell, one pomegranate, one bell, and all the way around the whole hem of his garment was a bell and a pomegranate. Literally, a gifting and a fruit. A gifting and a fruit. There was a total balance of gifting and fruit, or talent and consecration, character. If it were all gifting, it's a it's a discordant jangling sound yeah and that's some believe that that's where if i speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity i am become a sounding brass and tinkling cymbal wow. the sound wasn't right and there'll be that it'll be that way with people there'll be people that just don't i mean they're hitting every note perfect but there's something plastic about them there's mm -hmm. something so fake there's people that are amazing musicians musicians and singers and you're just like, every Holy Ghost instinct is like, not real, yeah. that's fake. But when you have someone step to the microphone that is consecrated, that is prayerful, that is full of the Holy Ghost, I mean, you are moved profoundly. And I would believe, I believe that is the equal distribution of both the giftings and the fruit. Wow, that's, that's powerful. Awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And that's exactly what it is. So you have to be a Christian. Yeah, first. No matter what you are. Yeah. <laughs> but that's so sim that's a simple thing. But I mean, people just overlook that. They're so gifted that people overlook. Yeah. They, they, they let them slide. And, and I mean, that takes you right to what our aspiration should be in music, which is to somehow be a part of music as a tool that moves people in the way that, you know, God would want. I'm sure we have lots of stories we could tell in this space all of us but i when you when you were talking about this it reminded me of a camp <clears throat> that i went to probably eight nine years ago and they asked this young girl to get up and sing she was probably 13 14 years old she sang with everything she had and she had some talent um it certainly wouldn't be anything we would look at and say it was professional or refined or anything but she sang that song uh, you are great you do miracles uh you're great there's no one else like you um and it just brought the entire camp meeting to their knees hmm. and it was because she married those two things together she yeah. gave it everything she had and she was plugged in yeah and i think at times that's something you know we we have to watch as musicians is focusing so much on the martha or the mary side <laughs> of uh the martha side of things excuse me where we prepare 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 and we miss that like hey don't forget why we're here yeah yeah it's, it's a great point i'd never thought about that before well there's a place in um it's running from me the epistle but it talks about the house of Nar narcissus um and it said that they had addicted themselves to the ministry mm. and narcissus is known for for um his beauty and he sees this reflection in the water and as the the myth goes the legend goes the mythology um he falls in love with his reflection he sees himself he becomes the narcissus the narcissus plant and always there, beautiful, but having fallen in love with his reflection, he dies. And it is, this is true of 
of gifted people. It's true of wealthy people. It's true of um, talented people. It's true of pretty or handsome people. They will have a this uber gift or this this natural advantage or this developed skill that becomes their god. They will fall in love with themselves. And I, I find it amazing in the scripture that the house of Narcissus had addicted themselves to the ministry of the Lord. Wow. So what would happen if gifted people, talented people, wealthy people, people with genetic advantages, you know, politicians, there's a lot of times there's a, they say that a politician, if he has a full head of hair, they're, they're going to do good in politics. If they're just tall and have a good head of hair, yeah. <laughs> people are so shallow, man. Yeah. And so, oh, that's a politician. They get this big smile, this megawatt smile. Um, what if people would take their natural giftings and say, you know what? God is blessed in whatever capacity, whether it's uh, wealth, whether it's talent, whether it's hard work that has developed a skill, whatever it is. And you didn't worship yourself and you didn't stare in the mirror. I know a guy that every time he walked by a mirror, he had to look into it. I mean, it was just like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, man, you got it going on. You know, and it's like, really? I mean, yeah. and I'm, people wrestle with whatever. I'm not trying to pick on anybody. I'm just saying, what a powerful thing when someone has that equal distribution of balance and look at the good they can do for the glory of God. Yeah. The impact they can make on so many people. It's a great point. There's actually a book, a, a very popular business book that applies here as well. It's called Strengths Finder. I'm not sure if you've heard of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really popular in corporate America, but it's the, the idea behind it is as opposed to trying to mitigate all your weaknesses that you you take what you've been naturally blessed with, the strengths that you have, and you build upon them to make a bigger impact. And that certainly holds true in music as well. Yeah. I had a preacher tell me that one time. I, I was the home missionary, and I was playing the piano. My gifting is not music. My gifting is uh, speaking, communication, or preaching. Scripture, I love theology. And I can do that, I know it. But I'm fooling around over here, fiddling on the piano, yeah. and finally an older preacher, a, a good mentor in my life, he said, stop. <laughs> Get an actual piano player. You're never gonna be a Dave Howell or Kirk Kanai. You're Nathaniel Urshan and you just need to stop playing around in the shallows. <laughs> and that's a, that's a message somebody needs to hear because yeah. take what you do, do it well, and do it. Yeah, yeah you can't be afraid to, uh to uh, have help, I guess that's what it comes down to, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I love the vision that you guys are casting. I love the direction you're taking. It's helping Pentecost. Um, the The ministry of Little Rock is great. We love to get you guys over here by osmosis because it helps Durham. We have an up-and-coming younger generation that you guys are very, they look to you guys. A lot of Pentecost looks to you guys for your for your songwriting, for your direction, for your music, and um, I, I love the fact that y'all are taking the bull by the horns and making that happen. Thank you for having us. <clears throat> I would tell you I've had the opportunity to be here in the local church many times. Thank you for every opportunity, and it's been fantastic seeing the growth of the music department here. I mean, you've got a group of people thinking about the choir. The last few times we've been here where they've, mm-hmm. they've just grown exponentially, and it's it's been awesome. You can feel their passion. Yeah. They're waiting in the room, yeah. uh, you know, at rehearsal time. You're not trying to find them, and it's, it's, it's just fantastic being a part of Now, before we go, hmm. Kurt. Yes. We've got to hear the airplane story. <laughs> okay. They're going to crucify me if I don't get this airplane story here. So, for those of you that are watching, you don't know that we are interviewing a hero. <laughs> this is an American hero. Superhero. It is a superhero. Yeah. Total superhero. Because people know you as the guy on the keyboard. You're the quiet guy who's like this savant guy up on the keyboard playing. But they don't know that underneath the calm exterior is <laughs> a hero. So Brother Kurt was on an airplane. There was a passenger that got unruly drunk or maybe unstable uh, mentally or something. Yeah, influenced somehow. Yeah, so he starts going bananas. Yeah. And the passengers had to subdue him. Yeah. And the plane had to land. Yeah. And you're on top of the guy. (laughs) Well, you know, the truth of the matter is I tried to stay out of it as long as I could. Like I was sitting there. It was he came up to the front and tried to get into the cockpit, actually. And I was sitting in first class and I was sleeping, I think. And I just he bumped me and and that's how I woke up. And then there was all these other heroes, you know, on the and they were all talking big talk. They were going to beat him up and 
stuff like that and I, I was just like I'm just gonna stand here I was I was literally out of it like when the I was trying to stay as far out of it as I could I believe me I, I was and I was just standing there when the plane landed we were actually all standing because they had asked us to like get around him so you know he, there was like older stewardesses and stuff so they were like you guys have permission to do which I know they probably don't even have authority to give that permission but you know so I was just standing there well when we got on the ground he tried to he was going to open the door to try to get out oh my yeah when we were on the runway the, like the plane's like surrounded by police and everything and he decided he was going to open the door so then someone was like we got to stop him well I still stayed out of it at that point all the big talkers that said they were going to get him he just pushed them all down and got away and then it's just me and one <laughs> other guy at that point and I had to it was like I had to yeah so me and another guy just tackled him yeah and then so, so next that, thing I know I get this video yeah. <laughs> Kurt is like shouting orders and taking yeah. control well, it was more of a body slam it, it was a bit of a body slam it, it really was but, yeah <laughs> with love yeah maybe yeah. but yeah body slam yes yeah well, we were just trying to keep everybody safe you you about had him in a Boston crab well. there, huh? <laughs> <laughs> this is his superhero logo somebody, by the way. he some, wears this under every suit so yeah. he just somebody asked up. me if I punched him and I was like no like in the moment I didn't think about it. I was like that I should have that yeah. was, there's several choir people that I could have put their face right there yeah <laughs> oh. Oh. No. <laughs> that's one too far <laughs> I got to take up for the choir that's so awesome <laughs> well we are in the midst of greatness here so thank the Lord I'm glad you were there to save lives all kidding aside, I am I'm, I'm thrilled about what you guys are doing. I'm glad you could join us today on Biblos. Thank you for taking the time to come in and looking forward to great well, we things. Thank going you, forward. brothers, because we met you a long time ago and you've made many stops on the ministry journey, other countries, medium sized churches. Now you're at the Mecca here and you still have our phone number. You still, you still talk to yeah, us. Yeah, you still yeah. answer our texts. We're honored. <laughs> right. We feel like there may be an admin somewhere back like saying, hey, don't forget about these guys. No. You said to remind you to call them <laughs> yeah. once a year. No, you guys are OGs, man. Yeah, we, we're we, honored. I'm we, honored. We go back. Yeah. We were there back in the lean days. Yeah. There. <laughs> and look what God has done. Yeah. And look what God's going to keep on doing. Yes, sir. So thank you for coming on Biblos. Thank you. And we look forward to great things coming up. We love you, brothers. We love awesome. You. We love you guys. And for those of you watching, thank you for taking the time to join us today. Until next time, God bless you, God keep you, and God cause his face to shine upon you.